Hi, I'm Dave Rawlinson. I'm one of the co-founders of Heavy Robotics. I focus mainly on mechanical engineering and controls, and I'm going to give a short presentation on uh, Hebby's philosophy of agile robotics development. So I'm going to discuss uh, why robotics is hard, uh, kind of our philosophy of agile robotics, um, kind of an approach that we take uh, that tries to get around some of the, the, the things that makes robotics hard. And we'll show that how we applied it to the development of one of our robotic kits, Igor. So why is robotics so hard? Basically, it's a mix of disciplines, a mix of very broad disciplines. Uh, there's mechanical engineering, designing the physical structure of the robot, uh, dealing with uh, motors, gears, torques, uh, electrical. Uh, there's electrical aspects as well, uh, dealing with motors, dealing with batteries, uh, dealing with uh, you know, limited power constraints. Uh, and then there's software, uh, dealing with uh, sensors, communications, a whole bunch of low-level considerations. And there's more software uh, at the high level. Um, so even tackling a very simple task right, requires a team of usually four, five, six people. Yeah, it requires a very broad mix. Uh, next, I think robotics really is an art. And I think engineering more broadly is also an art. And I think as such, it's a very creative uh, field. And it can be tough to be creative with some of the constraints that are in it that I'll talk about later. And also kind of like an art, uh, robotics benefits a lot from experimentation. It benefits a lot from practice, right? Doing things in the real world. And there are a lot of unique challenges that... Um, come out because of the need to work on hardware. Uh, first of all, there's the expense. Uh, you're not just paying for, for people's time in an office. Um, there's significant costs uh, to hardware. Uh, there's time, right? Uh, there's often limited time on a system. So even if you have a large team, you may not have an unlimited amount of hardware. So you can only uh, generate results or do experiments at a certain rate. Uh, there's expertise. Uh, robotics in particular can be very niche. Uh, the applications that people are trying to apply robotics to can also be very niche. Uh, so it can be difficult to find and or just difficult to uh, train up the expertise that you need. Lastly, there's a safety component, right? I think self-driving cars is a, is a prime example of this in robotics, maybe an extreme one. Um, but the things we work on can be dangerous. They can be large. Um, they can be... Uh, uh, danger to not just the people that are working on it, but the people around them, society in general. So um, all of these things lead to development that's that's often very rigid, um, and it can lead to decisions that are very conservative. I think in the case of self self driving cars, that's probably a good thing. A lot of other areas, though, um, it's good to try to find ways of kind of breaking out of this mold. So what is uh, agile robotics? You know, yay, it's a buzzword. Uh, but if you look at the Agile Manifesto, right, the, the, the thing that got this whole Agile movement in software going, um, really it stresses trying to create projects and, and manage things in ways that are much more organic, things that, that focus more on people than kind of rigid organizations, things like trying things in the real world and really responding to change and trying to be flexible really in your approach, even very late in the game. And that's very difficult to do uh, with, with robotics and hardware. Um, but uh, at Heavy, we've, we've tried to kind of tweak these in ways that aren't really, you know, it's not really a process. It's more of a philosophy of the things we try to build into um, both our hardware and, and software tools. And they uh, kind of in broad strokes are enable creativity, right? We want to be able to have building blocks uh, that let people try things very easily and get to a proof of concept very easily. So try it, try it in a real enough environment that you can tell whether or not it's going to work and whether it's worth pursuing. Then we also want to try to enable people to test in the real world as much as possible. Um, you know, there's it's it's overused as a as a phrase, but fail fast is something that's very important. Um, and fail fast and bounce back. The uh, last thing is really being flexible, not just in the hardware, but really in kind of the software and the mindset of uh, how you're approaching a robotics problem. It's very easy when you start working with a set of robotics tools 
to uh, think that there's only one way to go about solving a problem uh, or that one way is, is, is best by a long shot. And we want to be able to have people try, try different approaches and attack a problem from different directions. So we're going to talk about kind of how we apply these uh, principles, kind of this philosophy, as we were developing the Igor Robotics Kit uh, at Heavy. So Igor started off as you know what we call actually a uh, Friday project. So we call it it was a it was a creative Friday afternoon where we realized, hey, you know we have these gyros and accelerometers uh, in every every actuator. Can we use them to to balance? Right? Can we make a little segue out of it? Uh, and so connected together, we ran a re relatively simple filter. Uh, in this case, in MATLAB, the answer was yes. Yes, we can balance. Uh, so around the same time, Boston Dynamics had come out with a, a large robot named Handle uh, that balanced and picked things up. So we said, hey, can we can we add arms to the robot and picks things up? And the basic answer was, yeah, yeah, we can. We got to a very early proof of concept. Uh, we ran it indoors, picking up cases that were relatively light. And uh, we were thinking, okay, this is maybe the start of a, of a good kit that we can use to demonstrate. Uh, but then we want to take it into the real world, and we want to we want to run it a lot. So, does it work on slopes? Oh, okay, no, not out of the box. We need to, we need to work on that. Um, what happens if the the arms don't don't grip uh, particularly well? All right, well that that happens, and so it's important to design uh, hardware in particular that can that can take these sorts of uh, take these sorts of falls and, and keep on going. The uh, next little bit of injection of creativity was, okay, can we also add legs? So uh, this shows actually a couple things that are going on here. So the uh, you see gas springs on the legs because the actuators we have aren't actually quite strong enough to lift what the robot would be. Uh, we tested with some dead weight, and again, um, we fell over a lot. And the biggest challenge we saw with legs, as you saw there, there earlier, actually, was the legs tried to, to splay apart. And... What that required was was flexibility because the the joint level control that we've been running on the legs um, wasn't wasn't able to keep the wheels together but also keep the legs stable. Uh, so we wound up actually switching the control architecture um, that we were using to keep the the legs together, the wheels centered, from joint level control to impedance control uh, because we needed to be basically stiff in kind of the yaw direction, but we wanted to be flexible as the robot bounced up and down. And that wound up solving kind of our issues of, of keeping the, the feet together, even though we had pretty underpowered joints. Um, as a handy side effect, that same switching to impedes control from the feet also solved a lot of our problems in terms of uh, picking up boxes. So as the, the same thing that we use to basically have differential stiffness or different stiffnesses in different directions for the feet, as uh, we we try to turn in place, we can now basically be stiff in the perpendicular direction to a box, but be very compliant in terms of squeezing. So we don't have to, as we're teleoping the robot, be nearly as careful as in terms of how much we're squeezing on a box. So we took this system and basically ran it off a laptop and ran it for three days at a conference, uh, ICRA. Um, but uh, being robust is still pretty important. And uh, we did fall over a lot, yeah, kind of like this. So it's important to just keep uh, keep running the real world because we came back with with a lot of notes that drove uh, improvements in in hardware, a lot of improvements uh, in the software. And what we wound up with today as our Igor Robotics Kit um, is a wireless system where all the batteries and computings in the chassis. Um, but what's interesting about this whole process is that was the very last thing to get designed. Um, so rather than, cause there's, there's a lot of constraints that happen when you do that in terms of computing, in terms of, uh, weight, size, form factor. So in this case, we did a whole bunch of experimentation really over the course of about a year off and on, uh, to get the overall, uh, system in place. And then only at the last stage did we kind of package it up as a kit. Uh, and so kind of as a, as a fun final note, uh, we really want this, this kit to inspire creativity. Uh, in this case, hopefully, uh, getting uh, the next generation of roboticists uh, interested. So in summary, Hebi tries to promote a more flexible approach to robotics development. We think this really accelerates development in places that can apply it. 
And the, the key traits are enabling creativity, get to early working proof of concepts, uh, testing in the real world as much as possible, and, and being flexible throughout the process. Okay, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you found this presentation uh, useful. If you'd like to reach out, talk more, uh, you can reach us at info at heavyrobotics.com. Uh, you can also ask questions on our forums at forums.heavy.us. Uh, please uh, stay safe and wash your hands.